Good morning, everyone. Not bad. I'll give you about a four out of ten on that, but it was enough that I'm going to go on. Uh, I'm glad you're here, especially we're glad if, if you're a guest or visitor and we'd love to introduce ourselves to you or answer any questions you have. We have a little table back there. We'd give you a gift if you come back to it. Uh, we would just like to, to meet you and to answer any questions you have. Uh, for those that go to celebrate, we our church gets asked to ring bells for the Salvation Army, and we have two slots left, two one-hour slots left this Wednesday when I hear the temperature is going to be 70-ish degrees. Uh -huh. So um, please consider signing up and, and helping us out and the community out by doing that. Now, since we are entering the holiday season, we do there's different times and different things happening. And so there's a QR code that you can take a picture of now because you're not going to remember everything. I don't even remember everything I say. I work here and I still don't necessarily keep track of it. Or we have uh, at the info booth this all written out for you, just to say, here's, how, here's what's happening here and celebrate the next few weeks. So this coming Saturday, Christmas Eve, we'll have two services, one at 3.30, one at 5. We'll have a nursery available at 3.30. Then the next day, and please consider inviting someone, someone who was on staff here for a number of years uh, wasn't going to church, and way long ago, somebody invited her to come to a Celebrate Christmas Eve service and she became one of the leaders of our church. Um, and it all started with coming Christmas Eve service. People are more open to going during Christmas Eve. So please consider inviting. Another thing you could invite to is that on Christmas Day, which is a Sunday, we are not going to have service here. What we are going to have is a meal out there. So anybody that wants to gather around a meal, uh, you'll be able to, to do that. We, um, and it's going to be a feast of a meal. But it would be helpful if you thought you were going to do that, if you would let us know Bruce is in charge. And he's talking to people. I was going to get, he's the one that looks most like Santa Claus, one of the people that looks most like Santa Claus in our church. So, um, oh, there he is. There he is, Santa. No, just kidding. Uh, um, so uh, you could sign up back there just to let us know. You could come or bring people last minute and come, but it's just nice to have an uh, idea of about where we're at. If it's at 60, 100, 150, how many people are we going to have? And there'll be, it's at 11.30 and there'll be games afterward. If you're willing to help, uh, you could also indicate that back there. Anything else? Did I do pretty good? Oh, that's right. I did forget. So, we're also going to deliver meals that day, so if you know of someone who's shut in who would appreciate a meal on Christmas Day, uh, please indicate that back there as well. So New Year's Day, that's you know a Sunday as well. We are having service as normal. What is going to be different is that in this time, so there is youth tonight, there is Upper Room Wednesday night, but once we hit Christmas, during that next week, we will not have Upper Room for three weeks because of some leadership things, um, and we will not have youth on Christmas Day or Christmas night or our kids Christmas Day, Christmas night. New Year's Day, New Year's Day. I better, I better land this plane pretty soon. We're, we're losing energy. Is there anything else I need to say? Oh, if you want to pray... So we aren't having upper room, but if you want to pray, the building's going to be closed up between uh, Christmas Day and January 2nd, but we can access you a code so you can come to the prayer room if you want. We have, since we started Prayer Builders in September, we've had, uh, almost every time we've had more than one person coming to pray in this building, but every day we have someone praying, and that's going to continue. So if you want to pray, um, just with email, and you get, get that on this email, and Camille will send you a code as long as you give her enough lead notice. We, you know, might be busy drinking eggnog and singing the Yuletide carols, as we so often do in the Schmidt household. And so she might not be able to get to you like, hey, I want to get in in 10 minutes. That might not work. So, But we want to make uh, the building available uh, to pray for whoever would like to do that. All right, let's stand up, because that is enough of announcements. We are going to worship the Lord today. So to all of you who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, let's get ready to worship him because he's worthy of it. Because of who he is. Because of what he's done. 
God, thank you that you came 2,000 years ago, and thank you that you keep coming. Thank you that you would come for us this morning by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you can cleanse our guilty consciences, that you, we are forgiven because of who you are, because of what Jesus has done. So we ask for that. We ask for your healing to be released in this place, wherever we're fatigued or not feeling well. You did that 2,000 years ago. Would you do that again by your spirit? And we pray today that you would remind us, remind us of your promises, remind us of your presence. Renew in us faith and hope and love. May we leave this place filled up. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
your hands together. He's worthy of his friend. for your goodness. God, and we thank you for the ways that you run after us over and over again. 
God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this space this morning. Would you meet us, God? Would you allow us to hear your still, small voice? We love you, Lord, and we welcome you here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. We want to invite up all the kiddos. So if you are a Celebrate Kid, preschool through fifth grade, why don't you come on up and we're going to light the Advent candle this morning. All right, so we are in our fourth week of Advent, and there's a few things we want to review before we look at our word for today. Deal? So, the three... You can hold it up, sorry. (laughs) That was awkward. Okay, so, the three things first to review is, can anyone remember three different things? I'll have three different people tell me three things about the wreath itself. Andy. Andy. Jesus' love and his beauty of his love. Andy, that was so great. Great job. Elsa. Um, the, circle means God's love. the circle means God's never-ending love. Well done. Bryce. You have an owie. <laughs> Thank you for letting us know. Can we pray about that in a little bit? Is that okay? Thank you. And you're wearing hearts. That was perfect for God's un- unending love. Thank you for letting us know. Bryce, can you... Yes, the evergreen part is everlasting life. Man, you guys are real smart. Okay, I have three more questions to ask you. What are the three words we have gone through? So each week has had a very specific word. Are there three other people? So Bryce, Andy, and Elsa, you rocked it last time. Easton. Faith was week one. Come on, man. What about week two? Go for it. What's your name? Brentley. Week two. Joy was last week. Great job. That is right. Okay, we have one more word. Your name's Maisie. I love that. Okay, we have one more word. What's the last one? Hope. Hope. Yes. Okay, so now my friend Jenny's going to tell us about the fourth word. Yeah, if you can read that, you can say it out loud. Peace. Peace. That's right. Okay, you guys. So today, the candle that we're going to light represents peace. So this word doesn't just mean, you know, like when two um, countries are at war and they stop fighting. That's a time of peace, right? Well, when we talk about this word during Advent and when we talk about this word at church, it actually means something a little bit more than that. It means to become whole again. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of what this means. So everybody close your eyes, and you're going to imagine with me for just a second, okay? So imagine that you really want some hot chocolate, and your mom says it's okay, or or your grandma or somebody you're with, they say it's okay, and they give you a mug, and they say, just a second, I'm going to go make your hot chocolate. And so you are holding a glass mug in your hand, okay? So can you imagine that? Now imagine all of a sudden you accidentally drop it and it breaks all over the floor into all kinds of pieces. (laughs) That's not peace, right? It's broken, right? It's all broken into pieces. And so your mom, or you can imagine whoever you want, an adult you love, maybe it's grandma, or maybe it's your aunt, or maybe it's somebody you care about, and they come in and they say, oh no, it's broken, and they pick up all the pieces and they put them all back together again. And so all of a sudden your mug is whole, but not only is the mug whole again, but they can fill it with hot chocolate. (laughs) You can use it. Yeah, it's not going to leak because it's all put back together again. When we talk about peace in the Bible, that's what we're talking about. And when Jesus was born, everything started to get put back together again in our world. That's when it all started. Isn't that cool? All the sad things, when Jesus came, all the sad things in the world are starting to come untrue. They're starting to get put back together the way that they were meant to be. And when Jesus comes back, it'll be peace. 
okay? It'll all be put back together. That's pretty cool, right? So when we light this candle, that's what we are remembering. So you guys ready to light that candle this morning? Yeah, okay. So one of my favorite names of Jesus, oh buddy, that could have been dangerous. Okay, one of my favorite names of Jesus is Prince of Peace. So can I hear you say Prince of Peace? Prince of Peace. Oh man. <laughs> loud, Prince of Peace. Can you say Prince of Peace really loud? Should we see if the adults can do any better? Yeah, we yeah. should. Okay. Adults, you ready? I think that was he doesn't believe you can do any better. I'm just throwing it out there. So, adults, can you say Prince of Peace? Prince of Peace. So the reason I love the name Prince of Peace is because when I get scared and I need Jesus to make me whole, I'll say Prince of Peace be my peace. So today we're lighting the candle of peace, claiming that our Prince of Peace, he can be our peace in every moment of every day to make us whole. Will you pray with me? Let's pray together. So first, Jesus, we thank you for today, and we thank you for being our Prince of Peace. And we thank you that your peace makes us whole. And so Prince of Peace, will you be our peace today? Will you be your peace tomorrow, this week, this month, for the rest of 2022 and 2023? Prince of Peace, be our peace. And Jesus, we thank you for Maisie. And we thank you for her showing us her finger and how it's her. And God, we pray blessing over her finger. Will you fill her from the top of her head to the tips of her toes? Because we know you are the healer. And you bring peace to our hurting areas. So come, Lord Jesus, meet Maisie today and all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Aubrey, and if I haven't met you yet, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, this morning. We, several weeks ago, when as a staff we were talking about what this Advent series would look like, um, somebody brought up the idea of the Advent wreath, and there was such an excitement in the room about it. And I think it's because we haven't done it here for a few years, but I have personally loved it. I don't know about you guys, but I love the candles. I love the anticipation. I love that the kids have been coming up and joining us. It has just brought a lot of joy for me. So I hope it has for you as well. Um, And Yeah, this series we have been talking about all of the different candles and what they represent. So we started out, like you heard, uh, with faith, and then we talked about hope. Last week we talked about joy, and today we are talking about peace. And I have been here on the staff for a long time. So if you know me at all, you're probably chuckling a little bit at the fact that I was assigned the week on peace because I am such a great warrior. Um, Like, if there was an award for the best warrior on our staff, that would totally go to me. So it's kind of comical that I'm talking about peace, but... um, I also crave it. I really crave peace. And I will almost go out of my way to people please, the people around me, to keep the peace. But this kind of peace, this biblical peace, this has been something that has been quite a learning journey for me through the years. How to, um, yeah, how to meet God in that and how to receive that kind of peace from him. My natural tendency is to just go, 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 keep busy, keep myself distracted so that I can just push down any feelings of worry or anxiety just so that I can keep moving forward. Um, So yeah, we're going to talk about peace today. We're going to talk about peace through the holiday season because those two go hand in hand, right? No? Yeah? Well, I'm going to put up a few pictures up here of what I think we would all consider peaceful holidays, peaceful family gatherings. We have those. We don't have those. No? Are we going to have a video? Oh, we're going to have a video. Okay, so let me just describe to you what these pictures look like. So we had a a picture of a family that was all gathered around the table, and everybody was smiling, and there was candles, and there was a big feast, and everybody was matching and what they were wearing, and they were happy. Then we had another picture of everybody sitting, like the whole family, sitting in front of the sofa with the dogs posed perfectly in their Santa hats, and it was just beautiful and idyllic, and it was great. 
Jenny actually had emailed me those photos as some samples that we could use today. And her, in her email, she said, I don't know why, but these are so funny. Just because that's not, not reality, right? So instead, we are going to play a video for you. Not a very long one, but I think this is more realistic on how we all experience the holidays. Oh, wait, we don't have a video? Oh, you guys. It was so good. Jenny, Jenny put together this video for me, and it was so great. And it was like all the scenes from those famous Christmas movies, you know, like Home Alone kids walking with his groceries, and they just break. And, yeah, it was so good. Thank you, Jenny. Seeing it? Well, if we aren't intentional, what can happen, I think, is that peace is probably the last feeling we feel during the holiday season. Um, I think most of us would say that we want to experience peace, but we're just so dang busy, we don't have time for it, right? Um, we listen to classic Christmas songs like, it's the most wonderful time of the year, but I read this study that said, it was about 2,000 people that they surveyed, and they said 88% of those people said that it's actually the most stressful time of year for them. And what are they stressed about? This is what they said, extra financial strain, um, finding gifts for everyone, extra work commitments and responsibilities, family gatherings, and decorating. So even things that are supposed to be full of joy in our lives are actually causing stress. Um, they say the stress usually starts in early November. It peaks right about Thanksgiving time. Um, people are just saying that they're trying to put on the perfect holiday for their family, and they just agree they've just taken on way too much. So two in five of these people who were surveyed said they would rather stand in line at the DMV than go through holiday stress. <laughs> One in five said they would rather sit on a long flight next to a screaming baby. I would not go that far. I must not have that bad of holiday stress. But this is what these people said. So I've come up with an alternate list of feelings that I think we experience during the holidays. And you can see if you agree with these or not. I'm going to say exhausted overwhelmed, grieved, anxious. Anybody relate to any of those words? So how do we find peace, this kind of peace that seems to be so elusive, especially this time of year, um, with our never-ending lists, tasks, uncompleted projects? And what even is peace? Are we talking about the kind of peace that's based on our circumstances, or are we talking about the kind of peace that doesn't even make sense that we have it, but all of a sudden it's just there for us. This morning we're going to call that kind of peace perfect peace because that's biblical. It talks about it in the Bible, and that's what we're going to go after this morning. So if you were here with us last Sunday, you heard Allie talk about joy, and she did a fantastic job of that. Um, I think she set us up really well for where I'd like to take us today with peace because I think peace and joy a lot of times go hand in hand. Um, for those of you that weren't here, she shared that she felt the Lord say he was wanting to resuscitate joy for some people here, um, especially because this last year we've experienced such great loss. Um, so she talked about, a, about lament with us, a biblical practice on how to walk through grief so that we could experience the fullness of who God is. Um, and what's funny is even before Allie told some of us on staff how she was, the direction she was going with joy, I had already felt like the Lord had said to me that he was wanting to restore peace for people. For people who have never experienced his perfect peace or maybe who, for people who haven't experienced it in a really long time. And what I love about that is I feel like the Lord is wanting to bring healing for people so that we get to experience his fullness. So she said last week, and I think a lot of us resonated with this, we'd rather act like we've got it all together than experience the fullness of God. Did that rock anybody else? Or was it just me? Um, I, I started thinking about, in the very same way, I wonder um, how much of our own peace are we willing to sacrifice to have the perfect holiday, um, to get a certain number of likes on our Instagram Christmas PJ post, to make our fin friends and family believe that we have it all together, or even go as far as to trying to have it all together for the benefit of the experience of the holidays for our family and friends. I think for those of you who are hostesses, um, it's just in your nature to want everybody to feel loved and seen and heard and cared for and cozy and warm during the holidays. So would we rather have people admire us or run ourselves ragged to be everything to everybody 
than experience the peace of the Lord. And I think for many of you, this time of year is full of joy and happiness and celebrating. And if that is you, that is awesome. Celebrate that because it is such a good gift from our Father. But I wonder if for others of you, this season is hard. Um, It might be full of sadness or quiet or loneliness. But whether you're full of joy or sadness, I think we all recognize the chaos and the busyness that comes this season. Um, And what I think is important to recognize is that striving for perfection in that is not healthy. Um, I think if um, if you're trying to achieve something perfect, I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you. I'm just going to say, stop it. Stop it right now. Um, the perfect holiday life situation and perfect peace are two completely different things. And you don't get one and then magically receive the other. That's just not how it works. Jesus wasn't born under a Fraser fir with a thousand twinkly lights and perfectly coordinated placed ornaments. He was born in hay surrounded by animals. So I want to read you some lyrics to, I think, one of the most beloved Christmas hymns. It says this, Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. I think these words, um, I think they have formed a picture of how we view that first Christmas joyous and quiet and peaceful and happy and perfect, kind of like those pictures we talked about earlier. Um, But I think the challenge is for us today, our Christmases aren't perfect. They're quite messy, actually, sometimes. Um, They can be challenging, difficult. There can be darkness. There can be sadness. And, oh, thumbs up? Do we want to go back at all, or are we good? Just keep going forward. What? Do you guys want to see the video? It's so cute. Let's show it real quick. Yeah. It's done. <laughs> Look what you've done to my tree. Dad, how do you spell hallelujah? How should I know? What do you think I am? A dictionary? Tommy, stop that. Stop. Help me out. No, no. Get these passports out of here. Where's the Tylenol? We are sad. We are Hmm. Well, it needs work. I have to go. We had to have a little grumpy Santa going on in there. Um, yeah. So I think that's the challenge, is this is our reality, not the beautiful, perfectly posed pictures that we get. And I think during that, this season, that's why it's so hard for us to reconcile, because we have this picture of the perfect, what we think it was the perfect first Christmas, and our Christmases just aren't. And that's really hard to reconcile. So I think that's why we struggle to find peace. So we're going to take a look at what the Word actually says about the night Jesus was born and the days leading up to it. And we're going to explore the reality of what may have also been going on in those moments. So we're going to be in Luke 2. Um, We know that Caesar Augustus, who was the leader at that time, had ordered a census to be taken. So this means he wanted everybody to be counted. And the way they were going to do that was send everybody back to their hometowns. So Joseph was originally from Bethlehem. So he and Mary, who were living in Nazareth, had to make that trek back. So we're going to start on uh, verse 4. It says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So can we just stop there and recognize that the Roman authorities didn't care that Mary was nine months pregnant? And I think back to the ending weeks of my pregnancies, and I could barely get off the couch to make supper, let alone make a 65-mile trek to Madrid, Iowa, which was my husband's hometown. 
on foot. I, I just can't even imagine. And Bethlehem from Nazareth was about 85 to 90 miles. So this would have taken about 9 to 10 days for them to get there because she was pregnant. Um, and I'm guessing there were a few tears along the way. I'm guessing there was probably some arguing. Um, please don't ask my husband how easy I was to deal with in the last few weeks of my pregnancies. Um, but I wonder if she was just a little nervous, um, wondering, where are we going to stay? What, what am I going to do if this baby comes? If he does come, who's going to help me? And is he going to be okay? Because the, the reality is that back in that time, what probably was the plan for when she went into labor, was that she would have birthed her baby in her parents' home. So they probably would have had a room prepared for her, and she would have um, delivered him there. She would have had a midwife, probably her friends, her mom surrounding her. But instead, she's on her way to Bethlehem without any of those comforts. So imagine how she was feeling. So it goes on in verse 6 to say, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So I'm not seeing where it says it was a silent night. And if I think back to labor and delivery, that's probably the last word I would use to describe how that all went down. But I think the song Silent Night is a great example of what we do to ourselves today. Because the writer of that song, what he did was he took all of the beautiful moments of that night and packaged it into this beautiful song that then we can use to worship with. And that's great, but it doesn't include probably a lot of the hard things that happened along the way. And I think we do that to ourselves. I think if we look back at old or past holidays, look back at old pictures, I think we remember the good things from those holidays. We don't necessarily remember the struggles, Um, the things that are natural and normal in our broken world, things like the arguments that happened or the expectations that weren't met or the house that didn't get clean all the way, or the rolls that got burnt, or the green bean casserole that got ruined because your mom let your sister cook it and she put too much pepper in it. And those things just happen, but you tend to forget those. We don't forget that one. We actually tell her, we tease her about it all the time. It was fine. It was just a little, it had a little bite to it. Um, But yeah, God doesn't promise that life will be easy. Um, He doesn't promise that our holidays are going to be perfect, but he does promise that he's going to be working in the midst of all those situations, Um, in the midst of the animal noise and smell. Can you imagine? He was working. So I want you to turn to the person next to you, pick a side, and with boldness, would you say, God is working in your life? I don't think it matters Wow, that kind of went on a little bit. I don't know what that was. Um, It doesn't matter if you had an incredible year or an incredibly difficult year. God was working in your life, whether or not you felt it. And I think if the world were calm and bright, like that song talks about, we wouldn't need a Savior. But he came because our world is broken and because we're broken. And so I think that brings us to an important point that we need to address, which is that the perfect peace of God, which is what we were talking about today, is not the same as worldly peace. Those are two very different things. Worldly peace is based on our circumstance. So it comes when our finances are in order, our jobs are good, our kids are healthy, our marriage is happy. But what happens when the scales tip on any of those things? All of a sudden, there's disorder, there's confusion, um, there's anxiety. We feel like we don't have control. But the peace of God, perfect peace, happens in spite of all those things. It's one of those things where it comes and we're like, wow, that's weird. I probably shouldn't be feeling so peaceful in this moment. But we can't arrange our circumstances to get there. It comes straight from God. Um, As I was preparing this last week for today, Judd let me his book called Systematic Theology. Sounds like a page turner, doesn't it? (laughs) Um, There's this chapter on the attributes of God and it talks about peace. And it reminds us that in 1 Corinthians, it says that um, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And it actually had a really, really good definition for peace. So we're going to pop it up here for you on the screen. It says, God's peace means that in God's being and in his actions, he is separate from all confusion and disorder. Yet, he is continually active, innumerable, well-ordered, fully controlled, 
simultaneous actions. So what's that tell, that what that is telling us is that his peace doesn't have anything to do with inactivity, but instead with ordered and controlled activity. And for my type A controlling personality, that is awesome. I love that about God. Um, so I want you to turn to the person on the other side of you now and say, God is working in your life. Even when we can't feel it. Again, you guys just kept going. What are you saying to each other? I was so confused. Um, yeah, even though we can't feel it, even though we can't see it, he's working because that's who he is. So this morning, here's what I'm going to suggest. And if you don't remember anything else that I say this morning, this is what I want you to remember because it's not just for the holidays. It's not just for Christmas. Um, but we know we can't experience perfect peace on our own, right? It's something that has to come from him. We can't manufacture it. So this is what I want you to remember. In order to live in peace, we must actively pursue his peace. Okay, I'm going to read it again. In order to live in peace, we must actively pursue his peace. So that may sound confusing because I'm saying we can't manufacture this peace on our own, yet we're supposed to have a role in it. And I think what this means is we need to make that connection with God. We need to be going after him in order to be able to receive this perfect peace. So here are some thoughts I have on how it may help us to do this. The first one is just ask for it. Ask the Lord for peace. Um, in John 15, 7, Jesus says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. In Matthew 7, 11, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, which I'm sure many of you are very good at this time of year, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? God wants to walk alongside us. He wants to hear from us. Um, it might sound crazy, but he wants to hear our voice. And I try to think, because um, I struggle sometimes with understanding how God feels about me or how he views me. So I sometimes try to think of him like a proud parent. Like, he probably views me the way I view my kids, right? And so I think about when my grown-up girl calls me, I will drop everything to pick up the phone just because I want to hear her voice. Or my next grown-up girl, my 16-year-old, every night of the week, every night of the week, she climbs up on my bed at 10.30 at night, and she wants to tell me all about her life every night. And even though I'm exhausted, you had better believe that I'm going to soak up all of that time with her because I want to hear from her. And that's how God feels about us. We have to get that picture in our, in our minds that that is how he feels about us. He does want to hear from us, but he's not exhausted, which is the good part. So that's the first one, ask for it. Next, keep your mind fixed on him. Have full confidence in him and trust him. One of my favorite um, verses in the Old Testament is in Isaiah 26, 3. It says, um, you will keep in perfect peace all whose thoughts are fixed on you. So if we can push through the noise, push through the busyness, push through the distraction, and focus on him, that is, it can be a straight ticket to perfect peace right there. The next one is remember his peace. This is where um, journaling can come in handy. If you write down the ways that God shows up in your life, the prayers he answers, when you are struggling, you can go back and look at that and be reminded of how he has moved before. And that can bring a lot of peace and comfort to know that he can do it. He's done it before. Another thing to remember is that Jesus has overcome the world. The Bible tells us that, right? In this, in this life, we're going to have trials, but he has overcome the world. So he wins, which means we win. The next one is talk to someone. Um, I don't know how many times this has happened, but if I am struggling and I sit down and talk with someone, which it actually takes a lot because I don't like to talk about my shortcomings with other people, but if I do, more often than not, the person will tell me that they are, they are or they have gone through almost the exact same thing or something very similar. And that can bring a lot of peace, I think, when you are struggling with somebody, something because um, it can make you feel like you're not alone that you're not the only one that has ever dealt with something like that. And the last one is give thanks. And I think this is one of my favorites because through the years I have learned that this one works really, really well for me. Um, if I am struggling with something or struggling to find peace, if I just start thanking God in the moment out loud, just for everything I can think of, things that are around me, things that he has done, things that I'm hopeful he will do, a deep calm always comes over me, a deep peace. 
And I don't know why I'm always surprised by that, because in his word, in Philippians 4, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So that's the peace that passes all understanding, that doesn't make sense, but it comes. So we have been in the series in the book of Isaiah, um, so I want to read just a few verses to you out of chapter 11, um, because the prophet Isaiah is talking about Jesus, and he's talking about who he is, uh, what he will do, and what we get to experience when he returns again. So starting in verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He, he's our peace. And it goes on to talk about that when he returns, true peace will be established here on earth, even within the animal kingdom. So starting with verse 6, it says, The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who is Jesus, will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. I read passages like that, and I often think, just come, Lord Jesus. Just come now. To be able to experience the original intention that God had for us in the world and what we will get to experience when Jesus returns again. So this passage is a prophecy of the world be, being in perfect order when Jesus returns. And if you haven't recognized it already, the world is not in perfect order right now. And I think that's why we struggle so much. I think we have this internal um, desire for perfection and peace because we were designed to live in a world that was in perfect harmony. But when sin entered the world, all of that was broken. And I think that's why it's so hard for us and why we struggle. We have to fight for peace. We have to want it. And I think Isaiah wrote the key to it when he wrote 26.3. You will keep in perfect peace all whose thoughts are fixed on you. We have to keep our minds fixed on the Lord. The enemy is super intentional um, about not having us do this, about keeping us so distracted and so busy and so overwhelmed that we don't take the time to sit with the Lord and experience his voice, his voice that's quiet and still and small. And we wonder why we're so stressed this time of year, a time of year when we are supposed to be focused on Jesus. Satan's going to be working extra hard to make you that much more busy, that much more distracted, that much further from experiencing the fullness of the Lord. So I'm wondering this morning um, what it could be that's keeping you from perfect peace. Is it distraction? Is it busyness? Is it your phone? Is it the desire for perfection, striving for perfection? Is it a loss? Maybe the loss of a loved one or a job or a, a marriage or a relationship. I, I don't know what has happened for you in 2022. If you have had a great year or a really hard year, if you are full of joy and peace, if you are full of sadness and loneliness, or maybe you're just here this morning and you are numb. But wherever you find yourself this morning, I do know that the Lord has been working. Even if you can't feel it, he's been working. Um, I know how easy it is to get bogged down this season when you have little ones running around, when sickness overtakes your home. Um, but I don't think it matters if we are single, married, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, kids. I think we all experience this. Um, we get quickly burnt out and then we check out. But that's not, um, that's not how it's supposed to be. That's not what we were made for. And it's not... Um, what he was sent for. That's not what we're supposed to be experiencing. 
So I hope that you hear me this morning that I'm not trying to shame you. I'm trying to invite you in. Um, Together as God's beloved fellow heirs with Christ to rid ourselves of shame, stress, worry, and busyness. In Jesus' name, just to cast all of those things out to be able to experience the goodness of our Father and the fullness that he has for us. So rather than enter this season like the rest of the world who, is, who are tense and stressed, I just want us to allow the peace of God to settle in our hearts um, and our, the love of Christ just to hold your head in his hands and just lift you up. So I want us to use this time to realign ourselves with God and preparing our hearts for the season. Psalm 100 says, let us enter his courts with praise, which we're going to do here in a little bit. And rest our minds solely on him. Give ourselves over to the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, like it says in Philippians. And just let it wrap around you this morning. Invite the Spirit of God into your heart, and through his power, give all you have to the one who gave you breath. So we are going to close this teaching portion with what's called a breath prayer. Um, Breath prayer is an ancient form of prayer, And it's wonderful in times of stress. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. Um, I'm going to guide us through this. You don't have to do a thing. Um, But what we do is as we take a breath in, we pray the first line of the prayer. And then as we exhale, we we say the second line of the prayer. So I will guide us through the whole thing. Your job is to sit back, relax, close your eyes, and just breathe as I read this over us this morning. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? So as you settle in and get comfortable, take a deep breath in. Emmanuel. And breathe out, God with us. Breathe in, Emmanuel. Breathe out, God with us. Sense the Holy Spirit coming to reclaim his place in your heart. Breathe in, Emmanuel. Breathe out, God with us. Release any expectations you have and welcome the presence of the Lord. Breathe in, Emmanuel. Breathe out, God with us. Cast aside all your anxieties, all of your worry, all of your sadness, and proclaim his glory. Breathe in, Emmanuel. Breathe out, God with us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are indeed God with us. Thank you for willingly humbling yourself to come as a baby and to die as an outcast. Thank you for embodying perfect love and calling us to do the same. God, would you slow us down? Would you steady our hearts as you quiet our minds to hear your voice? You are the Prince of Peace. So in the chaos, in the overwhelm, God, would you calm our minds? Help us to remember that even when we can't feel it, you are present with us. Would you keep our eyes firmly fixed on you this Christmas? May you alone be glorified, and may everything we think, say, and do be pleasing to you. You gave us your everything, Jesus. You gave us your heart, your body, your spirit, and your breath. And in return, we give you ours. Breathe in, Emmanuel. Breathe out, God with us. Amen.
breathe the air of heaven My pain is gone And mercy fills the street To look upon The one who bled to save me And walk with him For all eternity the borderlands of space we sing his name Jesus 
Jesus Enthroned upon the praises of our hearts Jesus, Jesus You're the King and you're the center of it We can hear the roar of heaven as brighter goals are coming home again. Oh, the triumph of his name will never end. Oh, Jesus. have prayer ministers available down front. If you are in need of prayer of anything this morning, we invite you to come forward and let them pray over you before you leave. Um, I want to send you out with a blessing that I use quite often here, but um, it seems so fitting this morning because it incorporates so much of um, the different things we've been talking about, hope, joy, and peace. So this is from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you will overflow with power through the Holy Spirit. Amen.